it wasn't huge, but if you added it up over the course of the season, I just wasn't willing to uh, run the risk of it losing money when that money could go to our student athletes and our sports programs. Maybe next year, I'm open to it. Uh, I think we, there's a way that it does make sense. It just, we need to figure out how to do it and how to have it actually turn a profit for and, us. And that's something too, Steve. I mean, the fan in me you know, says, well, well, what can that be? But there, there is regulations and protocol that you have to follow. It's not just, hey, here's the beer, uh, give us six bucks and you can have one. Like there, it's it's a lot more than that. It's a lot yeah, it's more not my fraternity party back <laughs> in Kenyon College. Yeah, yeah, so it's true. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. And, and, and it makes sense. And we don't want to do anything against the university in trouble. So we're going to comply with it. And there's a cost to it. You have to have security and other things in place and uh, do it the right way. Uh, absolutely. Uh, more with the hashtag Ask Campy, but it's actually Ask Waterfield here. Uh, Sportsman4848 says, uh, when will we get upgrades to the locker rooms and, and possibly a separate practice facility? Yeah, I mean, that's been in the works for decades. And obviously, we haven't gotten it done. And it's something that I, uh, we want to get done. Uh, obviously, uh, on campus, in that new practice facility, it's well north of $10 million. And uh, obviously, if any of you have uh, that are listening to have uh, some spare change in, in that range, we'll give out Steve's cell phone number in a second. Right. Yeah, so I think we pivoted. I think we're looking at maybe the existing facilities that are uh, around campus that may make sense. It'll be at a lower price point to get us in there. Uh, once we get any facility that's existing, we've got to make sure we have things um, for both men and women's basketball that complies with Title IX and, and that it works and it makes sense that way. So uh, we're, we're always thinking about ways to get it done. There's some things that we've thought out big picture. Um, it, it's just we, we got to get that funding and, and get right. the million, it's millions of dollars to get that lead get and then you get the renovation and the operating costs. Right, absolutely. Um, Steve, what, you and I have talked about this in the past on the uh, pregame show for for basketball, name, image, and likeness. And this is something that you and I have chopped it up a lot about. And it's not something we get into a ton here on, on the Greg Campy Show. But, you know, as, as you look at it, name, image, and likeness and how it's come into operation, and it is a big, big buzz phrase that everybody, the sports fans certainly talk about as well. We, we were told that, that this was going to be, be the death blow for, for college athletics. And, and lo and behold, you know, the, the world's still spinning and the tournament's going to go on and the college football playoff went on and everything like that. As, as a community, right, as an administrative community, what's been the observations of name, image, and likeness for the athletic directors around the country? Yeah, I think for the uh, as a whole, and, and in particular for myself, I love it. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, things haven't ended. The world survives. College athletics will continue. Our student-athletes that are on the court this week have made money off name, image, likeness, which I think is fantastic. I just got uh, today a book from Open Doors, our third-party uh, kind of educator and who we use, all the Verizon League uses it, with every conference's kind of average in basketball, guard, forward, center, and all I deals, and it's all anonymous, but in the Verizon League, you're looking at the average deals of a few thousand dollars across the board. And men and women, that's one of the few leagues where the men and the women, the difference isn't that significant, which I think is fantastic. And uh, I think across the board, well, most of the high earners in name of are women, uh, women uh, student athletes. And that's a great segue to the next question, because Steve, we've seen in college sports, particularly on the women's college sports, uh, superstars. I'm talking about household names that have become superstars in the name, image, and likeness community. We've seen gymnasts uh, out there, uh, Libby Dunn from LSU and everything. I mean, they have become literal financial and social media superstars. Yes, millions. L millions, millions, millions of dollars. Yeah. Millions of dollars that they can parlay once they're done with their athletic careers into millions of dollars. So uh, they've done a good job. It's not easy. It's a lot of work. Uh, but I think that is where you really see a tremendous potential to really – monetize this in a way that hopefully positions themselves for a, a great success after they're done with college. Well, Steve, I was just getting the alert. The Tigers are getting ready for preseason baseball here tonight. We've had some work done at, at the Oakland baseball field as well. Like we've been talking about facilities and things like that. You know, as, as you, as you look at that, that's wrapping up right now. And, you know, we were talking about the goals for the basketball facilities and stuff like that. You, you've kind of put the, the wheels in motion facility-wide, haven't you? Yeah, so we just had to finish the walkthrough with a, we turfed our infield, which is a huge step in the right direction. Our first home game is March 7th, looking outside. I'm not sure if that's going to that's gonna happen, but it won't be because the field isn't playable. Right. So we've got the tur uh, turfed infield, which is huge for Coach Banfield and the, and the guys. They won their first game against Kansas 6-3 to three. Right. this afternoon. They had to Wichita State later this weekend. I'm excited about what they're building. And then on the women's side, we're going to turf the outfield 
once the season's over. So the turf's here. We just have to, I don't want to displace our women during the season. So we'll do that once the season over is over. And it really helps them not only get more games in, it helps us rent and then create some revenue during the summer to uh, teams and clubs. All right. Well, Steve, I certainly appreciate you stopping by. And as always, I appreciate the openness too. It's, it's not every athletic director that's going to come in here and, you know, address the facilities and, and all that kind of stuff. So thanks for the uh, thanks for the openness. We appreciate it. You bet, Neil. Thanks. All right. Director of Athletics, Steve Waterfield, everybody. When we come back, it's Ask Campy time here on the Frank Campy Show. We're live at RJ's Club in Rochester Hills. Six questions or so to get to. I'll uh, ask about the three point thing. Welcome back to the Greg Campy Show live at RJ's Pub in Rochester Hills. He's the coach, Greg Campy. My name is Neil Rule, the voice of the Golden Grizzlies. If you are listening for the first time, maybe you're catching it on the podcast side. Remember, we do this at RJ's Pub, but you can subscribe to the Golden Grizzlies, the podcast as well, the Bear in Mind podcast. That's your podcast home for the Greg Campy Show. Subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud. Just search Oakland University or Golden Grizzlies. Click subscribe. And you are in their camp. You ready for some ass campy? Yeah, before we do, you guys, uh, when you were talking to Steve, you mentioned baseball. And I think we'd be remiss not to let everybody here know, in case they didn't, that Jordan beat up on Kansas today. We beat Kansas 6 to 3. Uh, and in three years, he's turned that program where we're beating the Big 12. And I think we've really got to. Yeah, I should have had him on the show before they went for their spring break, but next year we will because he's done one hell of a job for us. Hey, getting wins at Big 12 yeah. parks, man. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's not easy to do. Yeah. Playing for the Rising yeah. Championship last year and everything. Yeah, it's it's definitely done a 180. There is no question about it. Um, yeah, time for some ask campy. Uh, I did want to ask you about this. This is from uh, Neil R. I guess in, uh, at RJ's Pub. <laughs> Camp, a lot of the talk around town today in the college basketball world was on the whole fouling when you're up three debate. You know, inside ten seconds, a lot of the a lot of, a lot of the talking heads out there were uh, were bringing it up because we saw it with Izzo in Michigan State. We saw it in the Wisconsin Michigan game yesterday as well. What, what's your what's your philosophy on that camp as far as you've got a three point lead inside ten ish seconds to go? What, what, what's the playbook you're running? Okay, so. First of all, I'll say this. All those talking heads have never coached a game in their life or coached a practice, so they have no idea. It, it seems so simplistic, right? Oh, you got to follow. It seems so simplistic that you would just go do that. Well, the truth of the matter is, is it's not simplistic because we're very seldom – do you have a cut and dried? Now, in the Michigan game, there was it was cut and dried. There was a 1.5 seconds to go. 
and the kid went for steel instead of you know he should have just gone up with Dickinson and if, if Hunter caught the ball came down with him and fouled him, you know uh, and you practice that but how it works out in a game the the margin of error by student athletes is so it, it's just such a big margin that can you really count on that or if you're a defensive oriented coach we work we work we work we take that three away and they don't they get a tough contested one. so what do you do on that you know the biggest thing there is when do you do it when do you do it i mean oh we got to foul up oh, you're up three late you got to foul well, what's late because if you do it with 10 seconds to go and they go down and make both of them, you throw it in with eight seconds to go and they foul you and you go down and miss. You're in a worse situation than you were before. They can win. Yeah, huh? right. Right. They can win. You, you, you foul eight seconds to go and they go up and they make both of them. You take it in. And I've seen a lot of times when they, you couldn't get it in. I mean, we've won two games this year where teams couldn't get it in. Eastern Michigan and Cleveland State, they couldn't get it in against us with four or five seconds to go, and we scored and tied the game and won an overtime, right? So so what do you do with that? I mean, this is the philosophy, and this is why as a talking head that you're not getting paid to do that. You're getting paid to create controversy. It's so, it's so yeah, it's a great topic. But the truth of the matter is when you're the guy that's going to get criticized, what do you do? Because the, the X, what you're trying to do is win, right? And if you're a half a point ahead, you win. So what do you do? Um, at the end of the half uh, against Northern Kentucky, we had a nine-point lead. There were eight seconds to go when we made a three, and I called a timeout. We had three fouls to give. No, we had four fouls to give, right? So I put Brody Parker in the game, and we've practiced it. But I didn't trust that he was going to do it exactly as I wanted him to do it because this is real life now. This isn't a practice where you get yelled at, you know. And then you do it again. And then you do yeah, yeah. This is real life. And he did a really good job. But you know who made a huge mistake? Can anybody in here tell me who made, who made a huge mistake? No one. Because you don't coach it. You don't practice it. You don't know. You just see the results, and then you can go and do what you do. Talk about it and bitch and complain about a coach. <laughs> Blake Lampman made a big mistake. Blake committed the second foul of the four. Why is that a big mistake? Well, he fouled on the pass. So why foul? No time went off. And they threw the ball into the back. Right. He's going away from the back. So what he should have done is they knew we wanted to foul. The, the instruction is after two dribbles, foul. We don't want to foul after one dribble because other guys are smart, right? They take a dribble and know you're going to foul. What are they going to do? Rise up They're going to rise up and shoot the three. And then you give up three free throws, and then you really look stupid as a coach at the end of the game because you didn't teach them how to do it. So we take two dribbles and foul. So the ball went in the backcourt, and Blake fouled where he should have straddled the, the mid-center line. And as Vincent brought the ball across, two dribbles across, foul. A good two seconds would have gone off. Now, instead of six seconds, they would have only had four, and we still had two more fouls to get. And it ended up, it worked. We did it everything, but they did get a, a, a shot. A shot at the end, wasn't it? A good one. It didn't even hit the rim. So we did a really good job of fouling, even though we made that mistake. All right? So now let's go to your scenario at the end of the game. Our belief and what we talk to our kids and honestly, I don't practice it. You know, you'll see teams do it, and then they'll say, you know, a guy will throw a half-court shot in. And they'll say, the coach will say, oh, we practice that, right? We practice that half-court shot. Yeah, right. Well, everybody shoots half-court shots, right? But the truth of the matter is in a game like you're never going to be able to simulate a game-like situation because you don't know how they're going to guard you. You don't know if they're going to guard the inbound or if they're going to let you catch it. They don't. You don't know any of that. So what we try and do is teach concepts. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And if we do it, this is how we're going to do it. So our concept is we do not want to foul with above five seconds to go in that situation. So we're late game up three. If there's more than five seconds to go, we are not going to foul. If they're 
is less than five seconds and they've got to go the length of the court, we're going to back off. We're going to let you catch the ball. We're not going to deny you. We're going to and make you let you catch the ball running. We're going to back off, and hopefully you're going to catch it going away from your basket. Spin, two dribbles, foul. All right? We're never going to foul on one dribble because the mindset of raising and shooting and giving up a three shot. All right? Now let's say it's in the half court. Less than five seconds, we want to foul on the catch. We want to foul on the catch. In other words, you're taking it out. You throw it to me. The guy guarding me lets you have it, and I foul. I'm the catch, so there's no shot involved. Okay? <clears throat> Many of you were at a game a few years ago where, I don't remember who it was, fouled us. And we have a play on a missed free throw. And I don't know if you remember but Trey Maddox missed it perfect. We ran the play, and Xavier Hill Mays got the rebound and laid it in, and we won an overtime. Green Bay, yeah. So it's it's not just because you foul doesn't mean you're going to win the game because it happened to us, and we won the game. All right? So the reason we go below five is because if most coaches will miss on purpose if there's only four seconds or so left. They won't, they won't make them both. Because what, what scares me is you make them both and then we can't get it in bounds and now you got a chance to win the game. If, if you only make, if you can only shoot a three, three, then you, we can't lose, right? So a lot of coaches believe that. So even though the talking heads say all that kind of stuff, as a coach, I know that if I'm up three, I can't lose until we go to overtime. And so a lot of them won't, won't foul because of that reason. And again, unless you've done it, unless you've lived it, and, you know, I've done it for so long that I've seen it all. I've seen it. I've seen us foul and lose. I've seen us foul and win. I've seen us not foul and lose. I've seen us not foul and win. But I do believe you should foul if it's four and a half seconds left. And then the biggest part of this, and you probably wouldn't think this as a fan, but you would shake your head yes when I say this, is are my guys smart enough to foul at the right time and in the right situation? Well, Camp, you just went through I've, all those scenarios. That, that was a lot to take. Now imagine that with the game on the line. Right. And you're tired and all that. And you've practiced it. Yeah. And you've – well, I got time to tell a quick story. We're playing Chicago State many, many years ago, okay? We're up – three there's four seconds to go i call timeout and as soon as ball gets across half we're going to foul okay kelly williams is guarding the ball he's he's their, our best defender their best offensive player i know he's going to guard him as soon as he gets across half court foul right so we go out they can't get it in there's another timeout call we come back to the huddle and I said, perfect, everything's the same, okay? Kelly uh, is guarding the inbounder, and they were going to, there's, I think, four seconds. They're going to throw it in and throw it to the inbounder, and he's going to go running up because he's their best player. So we saw that. I said, Kelly, just get back to the top of the key, wait for him, and then get him. And then I make the fatal mistake of saying, don't foul a shooter. Now, what does that mean to you? Don't foul somebody that's... If he's getting ready to shoot, shoot it, don't yeah. shoot it. Don't foul him, right? Just a reminder that they can go and don't foul a shoot. So we go out there. They throw it in. Kelly's man gets it. He drives up the floor, pulls up, shoots a 20-footer, 20 25-footer, and makes it. And we go to overtime and lose. Kelly. What the... Word we can't use here. Are you doing? Or was it more? Yeah. Did you not foul? And he looked at me and he said, "You said don't foul a shooter." Well, in the scouting report, number three on their team was their shooter, and he said he's the shooter. You said don't foul the shooter. Well, in that circumstance and situation, you would think that everybody in the world would have understood what I was saying. Yeah. But 
he didn't. And so when you think of all this wonderful strategy, you've still got to get that wonderful strategy into that little mind of an 18 to 23 year old right? who's tired, who is half listening, you know? I mean, sometimes you see me get in a huddle and I want to, in the old days, I could grab you by the shirt and pull you in and look at you in the face and make sure you're listening. If I did that today, I think Steve probably would tell me I don't have a job tomorrow, you know, but it worked. It worked. And today it doesn't because you know what? They're in a timeout. If they're putting for a million dollars or whatever out there, I got guys in the huddle trying to see if he makes the putt. They might be looking at the dance team. They might be listening to a thing on the scoreboard. And don't think when I sit there and look up and want to say something to somebody and I, they're not even in the huddle. That happens. And so it's so simple to say, yes, Tom Izzo should have done that. But that ain't the way it works. All right, Kev, we got to okay. cook. cook through the rest of these now, okay? okay? All right. Two um, word answers. Yeah. Grizzly fan. Coach, what are your thoughts on the league changing the scheduling structure starting next season? That's good. People asking questions in real time. They listen. I, like I, it. I you heard Steve ask, say he asked for opinions. Uh, part of that opinion came from the coaches group. The coaches wanted that other than two coaches. If you're Green Bay and with Milwaukee, you don't want that because – it, you're the farthest outpost of the league and you've got, if you're going to go play Oakland on Wednesday and then go home and play, you've got more travel, more expenses. And unfortunately in our league, too many schools worry about that instead of competitive, competitive fairness. And what we're looking for is competitive fairness. And what we really want to get away from is the Thursday, Saturday games where you have, we play on Wednesday and we got to play Detroit on Friday with one day prep and they had four days to prep. When we beat Detroit at Detroit, we had four days to prep and they had one day to, to get ready for. We want to get away from that. We want a competitive fairness where we have time to prep for every game because every game counts the same. Every game counts the same. So why wouldn't you have the fairness of that? We're not a TV league. We're not driven by TV. Right. The Big Ten can't do it because they're driven by the dollars of TV. Our league isn't. Do we make some money off TV? Yes. Are we going to acquiesce to TV? Sure we are. Sure we are. If they want us on Friday night, we're going to play on Friday night. But it's four times a year. It's four games, five games maybe. It isn't every week. So we want a competitive fairness. Uh, David says, Coach, you played in seemingly every major and high major program in America, including playing in Alaska. Is there any opponent you haven't played yet that you always wanted to? Two. Um, I played there the year it opened, Rupp Arena. As long as Cal's there, we're, you know, we're too good of friends. I want to play. He doesn't because we're friends. <laughs> that didn't make sense to me. But that's what he wants. <laughs> uh, he's texted me twice in the last week that he's uh, had community. He, he Cal goes to mass every morning and he's dedicated two of his masses to my mother. And maybe he won't now if he hears this radio show. So I hope he does. Okay. Uh, and then the second place is Duke. And I would not go to Duke because something that Duke said to me when uh, we were scheduled to play a game there before. And the guy says to me, oh, we're Duke. I mean, you should be the one that should not. I mean, they wanted to us. They wanted to do it cheaply. They wanted six to give me 60 K when everybody else is giving me 90 K. Why well, going to do that? And I told them, well, they were Duke. And I go, well, I'm Greg Campy and I don't give a. <laughs> and I actually said that, but now that that guy's retired and gone, they got a new world going on there. Maybe we'll get down. there. I would like to play Cameron. I've never been in Cameron. It's probably the only arena in the country that I've been in. Only big time arena. Uh, Pittsburgh Marty, in case uh, in case this is the last show of the season, I'd like to thank you guys for always getting my questions and, and treating me well on your yearly trips to Pittsburgh. Love listening from afar. Short question, what is on your wish list for next season in terms of recruiting? Well, let's see. I think we need a point guard. <laughs> Be a good start, right? Wish one, point guard. Wish two, backup point guard. Wish three, dominant rebounder. Wish four. Somebody can make a shot. I had three points. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. What else? Wish five. 
another guy that can make a shot. <laughs> That's about it. That's Marty. it, though? Yep. Okay. All right, fair. Uh, Jeff, hashtag Ask Campy, after the blacktop floor era, have you considered a gold floor for the Golden Grizzlies? I saw that on Twitter, and I thought that was kind of cool. That kind of moved me a little bit. I don't know. You know, if we, when we redo the floor, one of the things we have to do is our last, our last uh, business manager that was in charge of that. I'm not sure why our business manager was in charge of it at the time, but he was. He, the cost of the paint to do, so the outside of our floor is black. And then the black top was supposed to be black, is black, but doesn't look black. And on TV, it really doesn't look black, right? So when I saw that and I complained, maybe a little, um, I was told that if we painted the whole floor of that, it would ruin the floor and we'd never be able to repaint it because we'd, we had painted the floor like five, the floor is 24, three years old. And then it's been, it's not going to be able to be painted again if we painted it that black. And that's about a ninety to hundred thousand uh, dollar hit if we have to, you know, take the floor out and put a new one in. And that's why it went that way. Um, I think that we should repaint it and paint it real black. And if we have to get a new one, then we'll go out and raise some money or, or do something to have to get a new floor. Right? Having a floor is kind of an essential piece of having a basketball program. Like guys that can make shots and point guards and stuff like that, right? And rebound. And rebound. So. I think that, and I and I don't want to speak for Steve. He was on here, and he could have said this, but I think Steve's really on board with that. That we've got, to, you know, eventually we got to get that black if we're going to have it black. But I think that if you could really make it gold, that might be something different. But probably not. I like the black top. I like that we're known for that. Um, I like that people bitch about it. I like that the most. Not a school to bitch about it. So that's that's probably my favorite part. Of it. All right, we will uh, we will take a break. Now, before I tell you, however, about farmer owned dairy products from Prairie Farms are made with 100% real milk from local Michigan dairy farms. Prairie Farms, a proud sponsor of Oakland University Athletics. We'll take a break, come back, the final segment of the Greg Campy Show from RJ's Pop in Rochester Hills. What do you got? Happy cow. I can do that. I'll do that one when we get back. Oh, that one when we get back. Happy cow. Organs is really cool. I like it too. I like it too. There's no minimum rally. It's horrible. Welcome back to the Greg Campy Show live at RJ's Pub in Rochester Hills. He's a coach, Greg Campy. My name's Neil Rule, the voice of the Golden Grizzlies. Greg Campy Show brought to you by the Pino Insurance Agency, LLC of Mimic Insurance. They cater to the educational market. If you're looking for affordable insurance and a knowledgeable insurance agency, go online to pinoinsurance.com today. 
P-I-N-O-Insurance.com today. And because Greg Campy asked for it, the Greg Campy Show is also brought to you in part by Ferry, by farmer-owned Prairie Farms, dedicated farmers, happy cows, and real milk. Drink local with Prairie Farm. So there's that one, uh, too. Final segment of the show as we talked about Camp it's March Madness, uh, Northern Kentucky, the four seat, the five seat going at it. And uh, it's pretty simple, Camp. Everyone knows the stakes. You win, you keep going. Yeah, it's, it's like the radio show, right? If we win, we'll be here again. If we don't, we won't be here again. So there's all kinds of pressure, man. All kinds of pressure. And that's the big thing that, that most people don't understand that aren't fans of mid-major, low-major, semi-big major, whatever level you want to call us because everybody calls us a different level. But other than the autonomy six, if you lose, you're done. And, you know, Michigan State, they're in, right? Whether they lose or not, they're in. Uh, there's eight or nine Big Ten teams that if they lose, they're in. And then when they get to the NCAA tournament, that becomes what we're going through this week. For us, at this level, this is the week, the most important thing. And there's all kinds of pressure on kids. And that's why you see so many things happen. There were 32 conference champions last year. Only 14 of the 32 also won the conference tournament. That's less than 50%. It's like that every year. 14 of the 32 conference champions went ahead. Now, in six of those conferences, it didn't matter. So take that down to 26, 32 minus 6, 26. Adam, what? There, you're back, baby. Yeah, you're back. back. (laughs) Not so bad, huh? (laughs) Um, So for 26 conferences, if you don't win it, you're on pins and needles. And for us, if we don't win it, we're done. And we do know if we do win it, we're going to be in Dayton for the one of the you know first four games. We did that once. And I'm going to tell you something. That was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life. We took, in 2005, we took five bus loads of students down to Dayton. Our president, uh, you know, I, if I remember right, they canceled classes that night. And... You know, the whole world was watching Oakland University, probably for the first time ever that the whole world was watching Oakland University. And we won the game. Brown Marshall had the dunk of the year and, you know, the number one play on um, the sports center that night. And uh, it was just an unbelievable that we walk out into the Dayton Arena. There's 14,000 people there. There's such a contingent of Oakland people in that end zone. I still, to this day, I can remember looking up in there after the game and seeing, you know, 1,500 of the happiest faces I've ever seen in my life. All right, the game itself, Northern Kentucky. This will be round number three, both one on each other's floor. You hope that trend continues. That's going to be hard to to win there twice. I mean, they've got a tremendous home court record. but it's tournament time, and like I just said, you throw everything out. Right. You know? uh, you, the nervousness of it is it's, it's at some point in the second half, one of the two teams is going to make a decision that we're winning this game. And, the, and that team, last year it was Wright State, made that decision. We had a 13-point lead with 10 minutes to go, and we, we came out of a timeout, and I just talked to them in there about, you know, got to value the ball now. We can't give them any runouts. We can't get them, give them a spark to get going. And on that first possession, uh, a guy tried to throw a touchdown pass that got intercepted and thrown up the floor for a three, and, and the decision was made right there. We're going to win this game, and they did. And then they went on and won the championship. And so at some point in do-or-die situation, in that second half, the game's going to get determined. And I'm just hoping that we're the tough team. We're the team that, that decides. And with a guy like Jalen Moore right now, who's so dedicated to winning, I feel pretty confident that he's going to get that done for us. I was going to say, you've got the toughest guy on the floor, for, for my money, anyway. You know, Kentucky's got some tough guys, yeah. too, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. There is no doubt about it. But, yeah, as, as we wrap up, um, a big thank you to all, all of you. I mean, every single week, this this crowd here has been incredible for the Greg Campy Show. So uh, 
big thanks to everybody that's come every week. And yeah, who let it's, those people in to screw this up today? Well, <laughs> they had to hit Oakland head on, see it? Oh, they just left early? Yeah. yeah probably because of Steve. They well, probably didn't like what Steve said, yeah, so they left. Be it. Well, uh, it has to be. Well, it. Camp, the crowd's so big, too, you got to beat the traffic. Right. You know, no, and There's okay. going to be traffic pulling out of here. Yeah. You don't want to be caught in that. I think it's Steve. It, okay. <laughs> Steve, it might be you. said that. It no. might be you. Uh, I mean, it could be, I guess. I, I suppose. I mean, you didn't know 17 years in a row. I didn't. You're right. Mm. I knew. I just couldn't recall. Is that better? That's better. That's better. Well, usually too, can't like I can't usually have somebody that you know keeps that. You sound control. like one of my players. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have followed him it. right there. Hey, I should have let that ball go to back court. Coach. When he came across that court, I get him right. My bad. Yeah, my, my bad. bad. <laughs> Who the hell else is bad? Is it? I hate that. You ever see guys do that? Yeah. No kidding. Everybody in this building knows that you're bad. You don't have to say that. <laughs> My bad, Coach. My bad. I won't do it again. Uh, final, uh, final ninety seconds of the show, Cam. What else? What else you got? Again, I thank everybody too. You know, you've got a, a real loyalty and uh, to to our program and that. And it's time for us to give you something to really cheer about. I'm hoping I've got a really good feeling that maybe this is is the year. Then the last thing I want to say is isn't. Isn't our senior day the best senior day in the world? I mean, is there's no one that does it like we do. I think you got to give a tip of the hat. There's some people back in that corner that make it happen. Um, Giz over here, that they do a hell of a job, you know. And, uh, oh, that's a special day. Just a special day. Emotional day, but really special. All right, everybody, that'll wrap it up here today from RJ's Pub for the coach, Greg Campy. My name is Neil Rule. We will talk to you in Northern Kentucky on Thursday night. Tip time's at 7 o'clock, right, Cam? Yep. 7 o'clock, we'll be on the air at 6.30 for the pregame show. So, for the head coach, Greg Campy, my name is Neil Rule. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Greg Campy Show live from RJ's Pub in Rochester Hills. Well, see you later.